hallelujah, in our church. Get on fire for Jesus. Never mind this political correctness and all this bunch of uh, foolish baloney that's going on in churches today. We want to be a Holy Ghost, power-packed, power-filled, demon-chasing. Amen? You don't see that happening in church. You don't see that in a seeker-friendly church. You don't see no demons running out. In fact, the demons are in the, in the audience clapping. They like being in those churches. Praise God. Well, anyway, if you have your Bibles with you, you're going to open up to chapter 24. I'm sorry, 26. I think my next class on um, Bible study, I think my next class is going to either be on uh, systematic theology or it's going to be on hermeneutics. How to properly interpret the Bible. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to Scripture. There's a lot of people saying things of scripture that's not true. You got the seven day Adventists, then you got the you got the Jesus only people, then you got the faith movement, you got so many different denominations saying scripture says this, scripture says that, putting their um, meaning into it and not taking the meaning out of it. And so um that might be a good study to get into. What do you think? Good study, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's see. We uh, left off at verse 26. I know we were going to get into the scriptures tonight. Welcome those on Facebook in Maine and also in uh, India if they're watching. I don't know if they're watching tonight, but uh, God bless you. I know that Brother Sajib said that his wife is getting better and they're getting up to 95% better. So praise God for that and for answering the prayer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 26. We're almost done. I think we got what two more chapters, and that's it. Then we'll be handing out our certificates for those who have endured hardship as a good soldier. All these Bible studies. I don't know how many there are, but I'm sure that there's we got four things up there. Three, what is that? No, I'm saying this one. How many? How many weeks? This is over a year. How many lessons would that be? I'm not sure. Okay, we got a statistician who's going to figure that out for us real quick. Um, praise the Lord. While he's doing that, let's read verse 26. For the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in the corner or in the corner. So, did you get it? 37 weeks? It's not quite a year then. Oh, 37 lessons. That's right, sometimes I was gone, that's true. I wasn't gone that much. 52 weeks, I'm 37. That's all right, we'll, we'll figure it out. But anyway, <clears throat> here Paul is before King Agrippa, and he's sharing his testimony, as we talked about that last week, we talked about his testimony. So King Agrippa knew all about this, what was going on. And in verse 27, he says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. <clears throat> so, um, King Agrippa had some knowledge, he had some awareness of what the prophets were saying in his time. We need to understand that um, prophets are not always accepted. Most of the biblical prophets of their time were not accepted. Uh, on an individual level they were, but on a national level they weren't really accepted. They always wanted to kill them. You know what happened with, with Jezebel, you know what happened with Isaiah and Jeremiah. God said, I'm sending you to a people who will not listen to you. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. You know, Thanks for sending me to a people that won't listen. How do you like that? I'd like to be a prophet and go, and God said, I'm sending you to a people. Okay, good. They're going to repent? No, they're not going to listen. <laughs> then why send me? 
waste of time. No. God still wants to reach them. Amen? So he says, you know what the, the prophets have said. You believe what the prophets have said. Then Agrippa said to Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. Some people, you know, they need persuading. Some people, you need to talk to them on an intellectual level. Sometimes you need to speak to them some certain truth so that they get the idea of things. Because sometimes it doesn't make sense to them. Especially in the Gentile world we live in today. There's so much mixed uh, mixed ways of looking at God and so many things on TV and so many things in books and so many things in schools that are teaching. And schools are teaching there is no God. The school is teaching all these things. And we're entrusting our kids to at least six to eight hours a day, every single day of their young adult life, you know, the young life, the, 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 you know, the, the teenage life, to that philosophy where God is not important. Take God out of school. Take prayer out of school. God is not important. You don't need to think about God. And so young people grow up with that mentality because that's all that's been imparted to them. And that's why it's so important uh, with parents and with um, you know, the church and Sunday school teachers. You may not understand it now, and sometimes you, these kids are just acting up and stuff like that. You know, but you need to take control over your classes. You, know, you need to make sure that you keep, that you're the one that's in control and not the kids. And you teach them discipline them what it means to respect authority because if they go out into that world and they don't respect authority someday they're going to mouth off to the wrong police officer or something like that and they're going to get locked up and it's going to be their fault because they don't respect authority they don't they don't respect those that have the rule over them and everybody has rules over them i don't care what what you think or what you go into a store you cannot take anything you want and walk out the door that's a rule that's called stealing and if you get caught stealing you go to prison so there are rules that everybody has to follow, and there are situations that you just cannot just go out and do what you want to do. It doesn't work that way. So here Agrippa says to Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. So Paul was using uh, the logic of the, of the prophets and uh, the logic of those that were speaking to him and, how, and, and, the, and the factual information about Christ of his time. He was, he was showing him and giving him intellectual stimuli so that he would understand. He wasn't getting all spiritual and jumping up and down and shaking and doing all that kind of stuff. He was using intellectual conversation uh, to get him to a point of belief. And uh, he said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Almost, not quite. So there was some reservation there. Um, and sometimes people have those reservations. And can I tell you that, with those reservations, those people will go to hell. You can have a reservation to go to hell, <laughs> okay? Uh, and uh, just that reservation will send you into hell. And uh, you almost I am persuaded. God doesn't want you. Paul said in another place in another part of the scripture, for I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. And you need to be persuaded about the things of God. It's not just some blind faith. It's not just some blind hope so. No, you can know. We, I preached a couple of weeks ago about that you m might believe on the scriptures in John there. It says, these things were written that you may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to hope you have eternal life. You know you have eternal life if you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And then he says, then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except in these bonds. He's, what he's saying is, I wish you all to be Christians like I am, you know, but not with the penalty of being a Christian, which is being in prison. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. So the question is, here is a king. He had the authority to release Paul because there was no evidence against him. And verse 32 says, Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty 
if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Well, why did he appeal to Caesar? Why did he have to appeal to Caesar? Remember, because the Jews were, were, were conspiring to kill him. Remember, they wanted to kill him. And so he went through the system for protection. He used the system to protect him. And that's the only way that he knew that he would have got out of that situation, was that he was going to use the system and use his Roman citizenship to get him uh, at least an audience in Rome to hear. And at least in Rome, where there was predominant rulership of the Roman Empire, that maybe they would have set him free there. But again, they kept following Paul everywhere he would go. Every time there was a court, you know, a court um, meeting, they'd be there. They'd voice their opinions, even though they were lies and, and things like that. But he could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And as a Roman citizen, he has every right to do so. We're going to get into chapter 27 tonight. This is when the um, they begin to take sail. They're going to make their journey onto Italy. Um, there was no pope at this time, by the way. Okay. And uh, so they were on their way to on to Italy, and some things have happened on that way. We're going to look at that because sometimes. Uh, Sometimes men of God, they'll say something, and you think it's just them, but it's not them, it's God. And sometimes God will even warn us and will want to um, bring direction to us if we listen. And sometimes we can, we can save ourselves a lot of trouble by listening to the men of God in our lives. That doesn't mean they rule their li your lives. They don't, that means they're not inter intricately telling you what to do in every single aspect. But on some of the major things choices sometimes we get blinded how many know you can get blinded you only see what you want to see at certain times but you take somebody that's out of the picture that can uh, rationally look at a situation and bring wisdom and understanding into that situation and it can cause it can cause you to make the right choices and right decisions but not based on emotion or feelings of or, or of want and how many know we have wants and and our wants are not always God's needs. And sometimes when we want something, we don't wait for the right timing for God to work on that or to do that in our lives, then we can cause a lot of havoc in a lot of situations. Understand? Okay, good. Now it says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto uh, one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. So here he was in charge with the Romans again. They were going to take him, and they were going to place him uh, on the ship in their custody. So they were commissioned, if you will, to take Paul and these prisoners back to Rome, back to Italy. Verse 2 says, And entering the ship of Adramatum, we launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. Verse 3, please. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So he was allowed uh, what we would call a uh, furlough today. Okay, he was allowed to go out, but he had to come back in at a certain time. But his friends were there to protect him, so we didn't ha they didn't have to worry. And plus, those that were accusing him, they had to find their way over to Italy also. These ships, I believe, were probably government-controlled, uh, and those who could only go on the ships that needed to go on those ships and so forth. So I don't think they would allow the same, uh, those that wanted to accuse him and kill him, be on the same ship. You know, that's like putting a... a guy in custody in the back of a police car with a murderer at the same time. <laughs> I don't think that was going to happen. So they gave Paul liberty to uh, go to his friends and to refresh himself, to get clean, to get some clean clothes probably, you know, to do those things, and to um, 
and get himself ready for the next part of the journey. How many know that when you travel, sometimes you need to stop? Sometimes you need to go to the restroom. Sometimes you need to just get out and stretch, stretch your legs and stuff. So just think about this, being in a closed quarter of a ship and traveling on this ship several hundreds of miles and then having to get off that ship and then having a time of refreshing. And they weren't like ocean liners and they weren't like, you know, cruise ships like today. Okay, they were pretty rough ships, you know, to, to go on. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius uh, courteously entreated Paul, gave him liberty to go to his friends to refresh himself. And when he had launched from, and when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. In other words, they weren't getting much steam. They were going in one direction, wind was going in another direction. So it was contrary. It wasn't, wasn't to their advantage. So they had to either row or, or just let the, the ship go, uh, go its course. And when we had sailed over the sea of Sicily, Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Elysia. And there the centurion found the ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So they had to go from ship to ship, you know, like you would when you're traveling. You have to go sometimes from plane to plane. They had to travel to different ships to get to their destination. It says, and when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Solomon. So in other words, there was no wind. And remember, there was no motor. There was no engine. There was, they strictly went by wind sail. And so if there was no wind sail, guess what? They drifted. That's just the way it was. It says, and hardly passing by it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Haven. Now, that wasn't over here across from New Bedford. Okay? That wasn't the Fair Haven we're talking about. It was a place called Fair Havens. Probably they got their name from the biblical um, name here. Um, which was near whereunto was the city of La Cie. He said, now, when much time was spent, in other words, there was a delay. They had to wait. It wasn't like uh, there was a ship already ready to go. So they had to probably wait for another ship to come in, unload, um, you know, wait for it to get there, then unload it, and then repack it, and then re go over again. So they were there for quite a while. Nobody really knows how long. could have been months. But we, we know that winter was not far behind. But we know that the winter time was coming upon them. We knew that that uh, they had to get out of there quickly if they were going to get out at all, or they would have to stay the whole winter where they were. And he says here, and uh, there was much time spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Now Paul is putting his two cents in, if I could say that way, of, of telling them, and he said to them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with, with hurt, Our injury. Let's see where I'm going. Okay, this way we much hurt and with much damage, not only of the landing and the ship, but also of our lives. Now, how does Paul know that? Well, let me ask you this. What gift of the Spirit was Paul operating on? Huh? Yes. The gift of knowledge is knowing something without studying it or knowing about it. How could he know what the future was going to be? There was no weather forecast. He wasn't watching Channel 7 News with the weather forecast telling him what's coming up next week or next month. Or, no, he wasn't watching the, the weather. So he was in operation of the gift of knowledge. And he was telling them, he says, I perceive that this voyage will be with her. How does he know that? The only way he could know that is if God spoke that to him. So we see Paul in operation of the gift of knowledge. And he's warning them and he's telling them, look, you're going to be much damaged, not only of the landing and the ship, but also of our lives if you don't listen to me. <laughs> Nevertheless, look at the verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master. 
So that tells me that there was a dialogue there. Right? If he's believing the master, then he must have known what the master was saying. The master was saying, hey, we're going to sail. Okay? And these guys were seamen. They knew the ships. They knew the waters. They knew all that. And this is where, this is where people get in danger. When God gives a word of knowledge, I don't care what... I don't care what the best expert says. I don't care if the expert says, if God says no and the expert says it's okay, yes, we're going to do it. You better not go with the, with the expert. You better go with God. Amen? And hear what I'm saying now. Don't go by what the experts say. If God says no, you just God knows everything. He knows the, 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 you know, he knows the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. He knows what's going to come down the road. He knows what's going to happen. And sometimes God says no because he wants to save you the heartache and the sorrow of something happening in the future. We can't see that. We don't perceive that. We don't understand that. Okay? Sometimes, uh, and I can only give you uh, my word. One time I had a word for somebody. I told him, I said, you need to quit smoking. If not, you're going to get cancer. That was a direct word. I wasn't even thinking about that. wasn't even That wasn't even in my heart to tell that person anything. And God dropped that into my spirit. And that night, my mother-in-law, Linda's mother, quit smoking, never smoked again. Day in her life. The other person that was there didn't heed to the word, kept on smoking. She died at 52 of, of cancer. You can't, you cannot, you cannot listen. If God is speaking something, you need to take heed to what He's saying. Not important what I say. It wasn't important what Paul said. But it was what was God saying. And God was telling them, listen, it's to your hurt if you take off. You know, some people, some of the experts or the masters would say, oh, you're just afraid. You, you know, don't, you know, suck it up, buttercup. You know, just, just take the ride. Keep quiet. No. If God says no, don't say yes. If God says stay, then don't go. Amen. Listen to his voice. That's what, the one thing that, you know, I want everyone here in this church to be able to do is discern and understand the voice of God so that even if I'm not here or the elders are not here or the deacons are not here, you don't have to run to and fro trying to find a word from God. God will speak to you. Amen? So you have a personal relationship with God. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. So now we get a little bit deeper. He believed the master and the owner of the ship. Well, what's the owner of the ship want? He wants money. Right? He wants to make money. You know, he doesn't care. You know, when I worked a job one time. Um, this was years ago. Uh, it had to be, oh, I want to say over 20, 23 years ago with Bob Lewis and Jeff Hendricks. Uh, in this um, factory, and it was a die cast factory where they make different kinds of metal that has to be cast and everything. Well, OSHA had a rule in place that when these dies would come together and it would, it would uh, take the metal and pour it into the die to make the shape of these things, that you could not open the door until that thing stopped. The company wanted us to open the door three seconds earlier. Okay. And if you do, sometimes that metal can come out, and, and if it came on you, if it, you, you, and some people had burns. Even Bob Lewis got burnt in the neck a couple of times, and Jeff got burnt a couple of times. I refused to do it. I said, I'm not doing that. You know, and they were mad, and it cuts down production a little bit, but, you know, you've got to do what's right. But they wanted the profit. They want more production. That means they want more money. And, but the thing about it is that they were, they were putting profit ahead of personal safety. And if OSHA would have stepped into that company, they would have been in a big trouble. Because you can't do that. You can't put personal safety above. Uh, you can't put greed over personal safety. It cannot be done. Okay. But here, this owner, he didn't care about safety. Probably didn't even care about God. They believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. Why do you think why do you think there was one reason why they didn't believe Paul? 
What's some, what do you think is one of the things where when God says something versus man says something that people can't, can't, can't figure out which is which? The answer is discernment. You've got to have discernment. Ask God for discernment. When you're faced with a situation, ask God, God, I need discernment in this thing. I need to not go by my feelings, my emotions, or my own wisdom, or my own thinking. God, let me go with discernment. Give me discernment in this thing. So that I can make the right choice. What does the Bible say about wisdom? It says to ask for wisdom. But what do you do with wisdom? Is that the only thing you ask for when you, when you need wisdom? Right. So at, when you ask for wisdom, get also get understanding. The understanding is how to apply that wisdom. You, that you need to understand what God is saying. And so here, these people, they didn't pay attention to God. They didn't have discernment. They didn't stop and, and say, wait a minute, you know, they didn't respect uh, Paul as an apostle. He couldn't show them all the books of the Bible that he wrote because they weren't all together in one, one, one canonized book. And verse 12 says, And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart Thence also. So the majority of people are saying, you better, it's better that you go. So can I tell you something? The popular vote is not always the right choice. Sometimes you'll get people making the wrong choice and they're the majority. But it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it the right choice. And that's why we have laws and we're governed by laws. Because if we leave it up to relativism, we talked about that a few years ago about relativism. If we leave it up to relativism, where truth is, can be truth for different people, different things. I can think green is a good color, and you could think that green is blue. And they say you we're both right. No, green is green and blue is blue. Red is red, orange is orange, yellow is yellow. So what happens is is what that what the what the devil's tactic in that is is to tear down distinction, is to tear down truth, to tear down absolutes to get you to the point where you don't know what is good and what is bad. And that's the whole push behind relativism. So so if there's no absolutes, then stealing is okay. Well, it may be okay for me, but it may not be okay for you. But if it's okay for me, why should I be punished if I steal from you? So relativism, no good. The majority, not always right. Sometimes they say the majority rules. That's true. They do rule. But what are they ruling? Are they ruling the, the proper choice? And in this case, they were all saying, it's better we depart and go and leave. But what did Paul say? No. He said, no. I, I perceive. He said, I'm perceiving something here. Okay? It's like maybe he had a, a, a sprint direct talk with God, you know. Just push the button. Hey, God, what do you think? Oh, we shouldn't go? Okay. God said, no, don't go. Just like when I was, out, when I was a little boy. And they wanted to go play in that quarry in the back of the back of U.S. furniture there, and they were floating on a little raft. And I was going to go, and something said to me, "Don't go." And I heeded to that. The raft sank, and some boy drowned. That could have been me. See, you got to know. Now, as a little boy, I didn't know. All I knew is there was a voice inside of me that said, "Don't go." That was God, even though I wasn't saved, even though I wasn't a Christian. You know, God can speak to unsaved people. He does that. God spoke to the mad prophet through a donkey. <laughs> okay. Oh, 
Okay, where are we? Verse 12, right? Because we have not small respect. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, ah, here comes the wind now. Now nature is in agreement. So you got the people, you got the owner, you got the master, and now you got the you got nature. <gasps> hey, look, here's the wind. We can go now. Look, here's the wind. This is a sign, you know, this is gotta be the sign for us to go. Right? This is the sign. Let's go. We we gotta go. We have obtained their purpose. Loosing thence, they sailed close to Crete. Look at verse 14. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocyclic. That would be like a typhoon. An easterly wind. Now see, they hadn't seen this. They didn't know this was going to happen. So Paul warned them something was going to bring hurt to them. And it says, verse 15, when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. That means they, they, they couldn't control it with the rudder. They couldn't go in the directions that they needed to go. So you know what you got to do? You got to just let it ride its course. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergird, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. Now what's happening is because of their disobedience, He's losing commerce. He's losing money because people pay to have things shipped to other parts of the country, the world. And guess what? Now he's going to have to toss that overboard in order to make the ship lighter so it doesn't sink. And it says, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest. So that boat was a rocket. Now, I know Linda and I were on a ship where there was 17-foot uh, waves. And we were in the middle of the ship, okay? We were in the middle of the ship. And when the front of the ship would come down off that wave, the spray would come all the way back to where we were. And you're talking about, I think, two-and-a-half football fields long on that ship. They were driven. They were tossed. And the third day, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Oh, boy. You need the tackling. To hoist the sails and do all that other stuff. And now they have to toss that stuff over. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared. Uh-oh. You know what that means? They were in a real bad storm. They didn't see the sun or the stars for days. So this was not a quick storm, you know, coming in, coming out thing. It was something that was continuously bombarding them and bombarding them and bombarding them. It says, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest laid on us. No small tempest. It was huge. It was big. It was knocking them around back and forth, back and forth. It says, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Now they had come to a point of desperation without hope and believing they were all going to die. Think about that. Being in that situation Verse 21, I love this. But after long abstinence, Paul didn't just jump up and go, nah, 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 told you so. He didn't do that. 
after long abstinence, he let he let everything settle down. He let everything, you know, people come to that conclusion that now there's all hope is lost. That's it. He's done. He's done for. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loose from Crete and have gained, have gained this harm and loss. You should have listened. How many times advice has been taken too late? Too late. And people suffer for it. The economy suffers for it. The economy in, this, in, in our own city has suffered from a lack of, of listening to people that had insight into the future things. And we didn't follow that because we were so bogged down with our manufacturing of clothing and our manufacturing that we had, we, we didn't want to expand into other areas. When the manufacturing of all that stuff closed and went out of here, guess what? We had nothing. They didn't have a, they didn't have a vision. They didn't have a plan. When I was a kid, downtown was booming. Stores were all over the place, man. People were all downtown. It was, it was great. Now what do we got down there? Drug addicts? Homeless people, some stores closed. It's all dirty down there. You should have hearkened unto me and not have loose from Crete and have gained this harm and this loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Oh, wow. <laughs> Gee, thanks a lot, Paul. <laughs> First, you, you rebuke us for not listening to you, and now you're telling us to be of good cheer. Wow. That, 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 that makes us feel good. You know? We're all going to die, thank you. And we want us to be of good cheer. But then he says this, For there shall not be no loss of any man's life among you. Just the ship. You're going to lose the ship, but all of you will not be killed. Now I think, I think, some of the people started listening. after he was proven right in what he said before, and they didn't listen. He said, verse 23, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So God spoke to him through an angel, through a messenger. And he gave that message to the people. He said, look, God spoke to me and told me, okay, because you're with me, and i got to appear before Caesar, he's going to spare all of you on account of me. Hallelujah. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. God can speak, but in order for it to be active, you have to believe. All things are possible to them that believe. Right? Believe God. All things are possible. Don't go on assumption. Know when God speaks. It's not positive confession. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. No. You can believe all you want to, but if God didn't say all of them are going to be spared, Paul just didn't get up one day and say, okay, I'm going to have faith. I'm going to believe all these people are going to be saved with me. No. He got a word from God, and he believed. It's important to get a word from God and to believe, not just, oh, I think I'm going to believe this today. No. I believe I can walk on water. Well, go down to South End and get out on a jetty and start walking out there on water. And before you do, let us all come so we can watch you, and we'll, uh, we'll have a, a little, uh, what do you call those things? Lifesaver, you know, throw you a little lifesaver. Savior, because you're going to sink, guaranteed. 
Be of good cheer. I believe God that it shall be even as I was told me. Be, Howbeit we must be cast upon certain islands. Now look at this, verse 27. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the ship deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the ship and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. In other words, we've got to stay together. That's how we're going to get saved. Start going off on your own, you're not going to make it. Another instruction in a difficult situation. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let it her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that we have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. So they were <laughs> they were fasting. They hadn't eaten almost two weeks. I mean, who's going to eat? <laughs> Think about it. They're on a ship going like this. I don't think you're going to... Linda wouldn't eat, that's for sure. She'd have her head in a plastic bag all, all these 14 days. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat for you, have, you haven't eaten for a long time. And when he had thus spoken... He took the bread, gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat it. Then were they all of good cheer. And they also took some meat. And we were in all, and we were in all in the ship, 200, three score and 16 souls. 276 souls. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, cast out the wheat into the sea. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to keep going. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into w the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. Falling into a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground. The fore part stuck fast and remained unmoved, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. That's pretty big. Pretty big stormy waves to break up the back of that ship. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea, get to land, and the rest of some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. I'm going to stop there. We'll stop 28 in a couple of weeks because um, next week we'll have Brother Bishop Andrew Ayari with us. And um, so we'll be starting chapter 28 next week. That'll be the last, I mean, couple of weeks. That'll be the last chapter in the book of Acts. But I want you to see tonight's lesson, the importance of listening, having an ear to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. When you look at all of the uh, um, addresses in Revelation to the churches, all of them say this one thing, if any man have ears, well, we all have ears. But if any man have ears, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. The majority of the popularity of people or churches today that have left the faith, are going, uh, going shipwreck, if you will, and shipwrecking their faith, 
with this seeker-friendly movement, but everybody's running to it. People are leaving good, solid churches to go to these churches and thinking that that's the, the hardest thing since sliced bread. And you know what? It isn't. It isn't. I was talking to Pastor uh, Timothy uh, Trafford the other day. I was, I was we just talking back and forth, and I told him, I said, you know what the problem in the church is today? I said, the church has become so worldly that you, there's no difference. You can't tell the difference anymore. People are coming in in their carnality, no holiness, no righteousness, no sanctification, just coming in, going out the same, living, living a, a double standard life, living one way in the church, one way out in the world, and thinking that that's Christianity. And they've got that in their hearts and in their minds. And it's wrong. They become like nightclubs. They become like, they've taken away the holiness of God, the respect of God, the, the reverence of God. All of those things that, that bring the presence of God. And that's why they don't have the presence of God. They have, they have a feeling or an emotion. But they, don't have the, they don't have the presence of God. Where the presence of God is this holiness. God cannot, cannot manifest himself anywhere without having a spirit of holiness in him. The spirit of God cannot go anywhere where there's not conviction. What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? To convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Judgment will begin in the house of God. God's come, and when he's in his presence, when we say we, we sense the presence of God, it's not just peace, although that's true. But it's peacefulness, but it's also holiness. Righteousness. There's a reverence. You read in the Bible, every time God appears somewhere, somebody fell on their face. Somebody was on the ground. Somebody was not, not, not the way we fall on the ground. I mean, they, they, were, they were in a reverence position, covering their face. The angel, all the angels in heaven, all the seraphims and cherubims, what does it say? Those that are around the Ark of the Covenant, right? They, they cover their face with their wings. Why? Because of the holiness of God. We're talking about the same God. We're talking about a manifestation, if you will, of the presence of God. And we think that we can go in with the dark, deep, the deep, dark secrets of our hearts and experience this presence without any, any kind of retribution for that? Look at Yuza. Yuza just went to steady the ark on the, on the cot because it was going to fall over. He was doing God a favor. The ark represented the presence of God. He touched the presence of God in an unhealthy manner. The flesh cannot do it. And yet he touched it, and he died. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. They dropped dead right there in the service. Think about that. Imagine coming to church, and everybody's happy and giving an offering, and, and, and they give an offering, and the man of God, whoever it is, says, is that what God told you to give? Yep, that's what he told us to give. And it was a lie. Boom, they dropped dead. How would you feel if two people dropped dead right in the service? He said, you didn't lie unto man, you lied unto God. So I want to encourage you, as we seek the Lord, as we, we really want the presence of God in our church, we really want to see this church grow, we really want to see things happen. But it's not going to happen without holiness, righteousness, reverence for God, not only in this building, but in people home. Amen your home, having that reverence and that awareness of his presence. And I'm telling you, if you would begin to practice, I, I call it practicing the presence of God. There's a book by that name, by that title, by the way. Practicing the presence of God. It's, it's inviting him. He doesn't come by force. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He will not come by force. But you invite him in. Holy Spirit, and don't look for curtains to move and all that kind of foolishness. And you just sit there and say, Holy Spirit, you come in. Come and fellowship with I welcome you. We sing that song, Welcome Holy Spirit. Be here in our presence. There's the omnipresence of God where he's everywhere present. Okay? 
then there's places where God's presence is, like in Bethel and the different places in the Bible. But then there's the manifest presence of God also, where God is manifesting himself. And the place he wants to manifest himself, guess where that is? Wherever he's invited. You find these seeker-friendly churches and, and listen to some of their messages. You don't hear any messages. Very seldom you hear a message on the blood, repentance, forgiveness, Holy Spirit, holiness, righteousness. None of that. Just come as you are, be as you are, that's all. We're just there gathering everybody together. It doesn't matter. Sinner, saint, Christian, heretic. Everybody gets together. That's not the church. So I encourage you, listen to the voice of God. Have a discerning ear to hear the voice of God. Don't be afraid if God says no to stand up to those who oppose you and say, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I told Linda many, many, many years ago, it never happened. It never happened to me. And it, it won't happen. But I told Linda before, I said, listen, if you backslide, don't expect me to backslide with you. I'm not going to. If that means you leave and divorce me, then that's it. Not that anything was ever coming to that. I just had to say that to her. And I wanted her to know, this is, this is for real. This is for forever. I told her, I won't marry you unless you eat anything and go anywhere. I told you the story. And she does. I mean, she went anywhere. She ate anything. She went to Africa. Right? We don't even know what went on. Don't want to know what went on. Now see, if I was married to Tara, she can eat anything. That girl can eat anything, man. She just eats anything. That's just her. She loves everything. I don't know. She makes good missionaries. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you, we praise you. God, we just ask for your manifest presence in our church. Father, we pray that you be here this Sunday, Father, and that you would, you would conduct the service. Lord, I pray that there be a mighty outpouring of your Holy Spirit here Sunday morning. Father, your presence will be so prevalent in this place that people will be touched, people will be healed, people will be delivered. Father, that there be gifts of the Spirit in operation. Father, there be tongues and interpretation in tongues. I pray, Father, for your, for your manifestation of your power and your presence in this place. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, be with us as we go our separate ways tonight. And we thank you and praise you for your word, for who you are in our lives. We will love you. And we will not forsake you or leave you, God. We're going to stay with you to the end. For you said, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor wickedness in high places are able to separate us from your love. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.